Welcome to episode one of Rich Dewisberg's Car Mag podcast. In this episode, we look at the March 2023 issue of Evo magazine, The Thrill of Driving, and we take a trip down memory lane and wonder what ever happened to practical performance car, the performance tuning for grown ups. So, let's jump in. So Evo, the thrill of driving is the uh, the strap line there, nicely bound. This is uh, five ninety nine on the shelf, nice glossy cover. Let's jump in. So the thrill of driving. First thing we get here is a, a double page advert for MG. More of the car you need for a lot less from thirteen thousand seven hundred and ninety five pounds. It says that is cheap. How can they make a car that cheap? Okay, contents page covers, uh, this is Croatia I believe, where the two cover cars were brought together for a, a shoot. List of contents, picture of a Skoda doing a skid. Evo should be the, the thrill of skids, not the thrill of driving I think. And here we go, intro from the editor Stuart Gallagher. Stuart says, um, in performance car terms, 2022 saw a torrent of hardcore new metal and that shows no signs of abating in 2023. And he talks about um, BMW's M2, for example, the uh, the new Aston Martin DB11, a new McLaren, the AMG versioned uh, Emira, uh, the Corvette Z06, or should that be Z06, I don't know, uh, an SUV with a Ferrari in it, and uh, new 911s, new Mustangs, and new Lamborghini Aventador. And he goes on to say here that these are all pretty much without exception, either sold out or limited run specials, priced at a level to make a banker wince. Um, and he says that genuinely affordable driver's cars are becoming an endangered species, and I totally agree, and I, th I think it's a very good point that he makes. On the other hand, uh, if you're sort of hinting at wanting more affordable sports cars, then, you know, why have we got this on the cover here? There's probably four to five million pounds worth of metal here. And I do like this, the world's fastest cars together at last, like it's some kind of long lost romance. Uh, anyway, let's jump in. Uh, first driven feature here is written by uh, Richard Meaden and photography by Aston Parrott. Uh, this is a feature on the a Alpine A110R, which is even lighter than the uh, the launch version. So this is down to 1,082 kilograms now, which is pretty impressive, it has to be said. As, uh, as SUVs and sports cars get chunkier, it's great to see somebody doing the lightweight thing, other than just Lotus. And there's a lot of comparisons with Lotus here. Uh, in the story, the, uh, the, the, the writer talks about the difficulty of getting the car sideways for the camera. And it's very Evo, of course, to be throwing a car about. But here you can see that it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And that points to the fact that there's no drift mode silliness or showboating here. This is a proper sports car. Sports cars aren't really designed to go sideways. So that's good to see. Um, I absolutely love this uh, blue paint. This is a matte uh, blue paint. It's, I think it's a £6,000 cost option and uh, what a beautiful thing it is as well. Um, yeah, Meaden says, this is rare and exotic with admirable authenticity. It's got true star quality and it is really impressive. It's a great looking car. One thing, I don't know if you can see this, but the uh, the front and rear wheels uh, are actually of a slightly different design, which is, it's kind of cool. It makes me think of that hot Peugeot that was uh, painted one half, one color and the other half, the other slashed diagonally, uh, which didn't quite work for them, but I do like a bit of uh, Gallic bravery. Um, so yeah, great feature. And well, Evo rate this four out of five. It stays true to the Alpine philosophy, but falls short on track with no power hike. So that's the thick end of 90 grand uh, for a car that will do not to 60 in 3.9 seconds. And wow, lots and lots of lovely details. Great feature. Next up. Maserati Gran Turismo Trofeo, if I pronounce that correctly, a bit of a mouthful. Um, it says here that Maserati is enjoying a resurgence led by the Evo Car of the Year winning MC20 Supercar. The new Gran Turismo shares a detuned version of its magnificent twin turbo V6, but does it have the same magic? I do like that rhetorical question, and when, uh, when a, a feature leads with this uh, kind of rhetorical question, I always jump straight to the end and look for the answer. Uh, does it have the same magic? It doesn't say here. I'm going to assume it doesn't then. Um, this choice of colour is interesting as well. You see a lot of press cars and media, media photography done of cars in this colour. And I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true, that they choose that sort of deep metallic red because it's most easily replicated across... Uh, media format. So for example, the red that you see here would be almost exactly the same as you would see in real life and also the same on screen and there's something to do with the human eye 
recognizing that color. Um, so there's some science behind why they picked that, uh, that color. Um, and it says here, yeah, the Gran Turismo Trofeo is simply a stunningly handsome car. Yeah, it is, that's a fantastic looking thing. Uh, one thing I do like here is uh, they've taken a shot of the dash and the, the speedo and so on. And I like that the tire pressure warning light is on there. Maybe it's supposed to be, maybe it's not. Um, my time with Italian cars, which I absolutely love, make me think probably the latter. Moving on, the Vauxhall Astra GSE. Um, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? This is a, uh, a hot electric Vauxhall Astra, essentially. And for those of us like me that grew up, um, <laughs> nearly admitted to stealing cars on camera then, um, you know, the j happy joyriding days of Astra GTEs and RS Turbos and so on. I was always a Vauxhall man, great engines, Chassis is not quite as good as the Ford stuff back then. So when I saw this, I thought, well, maybe this is a car for me. But really, it's quite a, a disappointment. Um, 0 to 60 in seven and a half seconds. It weighs 1,700 kilos. I think it's just a, a nice, chunky-looking car that happens to be electric. Nothing really to get excited about. Nevo say here, um, yeah, another, ish, another story by Stuart. He says, it's let down by lacklustre drivetrain and lack of performance. Yeah, yeah, we'll move on. Um, Porsche Macan. It wouldn't be an Evo without lots of Porsche content, would it? This is the Macan T, um, this is £55,800 and uh, well, I don't have a downer on this, but this is very Volkswagen to me. This is uh, very much standard MQB platform, platform share nonsense. And even in the text here, uh, this, this feature references things like the Golf GTI and jacked up crossovers. And I think it's fair to say that. Now that doesn't make it a bad car. That's, um, you know, it's it does everything that a family car should do, I would imagine. Um, but as it says here, you know, it has the Porsche dynamic qualities, but it has none of the performance. I'm not going to get excited by that. You might also notice with photography how they, uh, in order to get a full shot on a page, they actually stretch, they'll stretch this image in order that uh, the little bit that you lose in the crease in the fold of the, of the spine here, um, that make the image slightly longer so you can see the, the image in full as it runs across the center spread. So the car doesn't look unusually short. Ah, now this is more like it. Ford F-150 Lightning. Um, this is kind of an old school feature and an old school vehicle, but when you when you get into it, this is Richard Porter writing, by the way, you realize that this is the electric version and this thing that is sort of nearly six meters long and weighs, what, about three tons, will do naught to 60 in four seconds. Shouldn't get hung up on the numbers, um, but it's a riot. It's a very, very crazy thing uh, indeed. Uh, Porter says it's delightfully stupid and stupidly delightful, and I, I like that. Uh, really nice in-depth feature by John Barker uh, on Radical, who are based in Peterborough, making fantastic lightweight racing cars. And uh, there's an interview here with the sales and marketing director, Dan Redpath. Good legs of stance pose there, flash of the watch. He looks a bit like divorced dad off on a, on a Sunday date uh, with somebody who's met on the internet to me there. Um, <laughs> apologies if you're watching. You're certainly sharper dressed than me, but uh, yeah, I like that. Flash of watch, uh, blazer slightly too small and what appear to be supermarket jeans. Hey, I'm not bashing it. I'm no better dressed than you. Great story here. Basically, it's an in-depth technical look at what they do and why they do it differently. And John Barker is quite a techie kind of writer. And in here, they delve into why biofuels are interesting. And here they say, you know, biofuels are attractive because it means we can retain combustion engines as everybody goes to EVs for performance. Um, you know, Radical, in, in some respects, it's a high-tech company, but on the other hand, it's got an old recipe. So lovely photography, uh, great feature, and apologies to Dan there for me dissing your clothes. Um, adverts, advert for Evo track days. Uh, I've done one of these before, actually. Um, there, there are events at Bedford, at Brands Hatch, Goodwood, and so on. Bedford, I'm never excited about Bedford. It always seems to rain there. And I like this, uh, for those watching as opposed to listening, you'll get a different perspective on this, but uh, they've got a photograph of the cars on track at Brands and the queued up at Goodwood. And uh, I'm not quite sure where this one is. I think it might be Goodwood as well. But there's a, a picture of the snacks uh, on offer because obviously uh, you get uh, breakfast, lunch, and tea. These appear to be fried genitals. This looks like bread crumbed cock and balls to me. Wow, they put on everything for you. Look at this, they put a flyer inside the magazine to tell you to buy print. Um, unlock all of our, um, unlock all our subscriber only perks. Unlock them yourself and uh, don't, be, uh, <laughs> don't be printing for the sake of it. Great interview now by John with uh, Lawrence Tomlinson, who's the chairman of Ginetta Cars. Um, 
and this is really nice. You can tell he's a proper, proper petrol head. He talks here about one of his uh, first cars was a 1960s Ford console and it had languished in his granddad's garage for years and basically um, he wanted to get it going and the fuel tank was so full of rust that he got a, a one gallon container and screwed it to the roof in order to get fuel to the car. I love that kind of stuff. And then of course, lovely photography. Fantastic, uh, fantastic vehicles here. We've got a Capri, Audi Quattro, early Genettas. Uh, really good, really like that. Watch advert, I really hate watch adverts and uh, watch letters. Uh, letters here, one from Nick Frost, one from Ben Sawyer. These are both referring to uh, lower powered cars being more fun and reminiscing about 306 GTIs and 306 rallies and so on. So yeah, it's funny, we, we buy this for the thrill of driving and it's nice to have some aspirational stuff on the cover, but the stuff that seems to get people going really is uh, the cheap and cheerful stuff. More watches. A Tag Heuer Monza Flyback Chronometer. Why don't they just say watch? This is £11,000. Is there something different between a chronometer and a watch? And should I perhaps not be quite so riled by these things? Not my magazine, after all. Uh, column from Richard Meaden. I would love to see more of this. So in here, for example, he tells a story about when he took, uh, he and a colleague uh, took uh, an Audi Ur Quattro 20 valve down to Umbria for the launch of the Mark 1 Audi TT. And it's a road trip story. And it's great. I really like that. Stories of XKR Coupes and uh, Maserati 3200 GTs. Really, really lovely. I love this because I think these are tales from perhaps 20 years ago or more. And there's no fear of offending press fleet people with uh, with stories here. I think it's okay to talk about the things that went right and things that went wrong. And you get a, a real taste of it. And also, it adds more credibility to other features because, you know, if you're admitting things that are wrong, when somebody says that it's right, you're more likely to believe them. Nice column from Richard Porter when, uh, we, as um, Richard writes some fantastic stuff here, uh, he's talking about higher cars. Um, in this case, what I paid for was Toyota Camry or similar, so you can imagine my disappointment when I got an actual Toyota Camry. Um, I do like that. Story from Jethro talking about tech, and then into a big feature about the Honda Civic Type R, latest version of that, and they pitch it against the Golf R, the Audi RS3, which to me is much the same car, right? And the brilliant Hyundai i30N. Um, lovely in car photograph and you can see other G meters and uh, yeah the car really uh, really working it's doing 30 mile an hour you can see on the screen and these cars are quite closely packed and you can see there's moisture so it's not easy to get this photography um, I won't spoil it if you're that interested in knowing which one's which you can buy the magazine and compare yourself but I really like the pictures again because here you can see the cars cocking it inside well this is a real trait with uh, Evo photography is getting a car airborne um, and showing it and here you see it with the Hyundai i30 Right, maybe this is one for the comments. Hyundai, Hyundai. There's a big TV campaign at the moment, um, sort of politely making fun of those that can't pronounce Hyundai correctly and telling us that that's how you're supposed to say it. Things I've been saying it's Hyundai for 20 odd years and whilst that's almost certainly wrong, it's a bit peculiar of a manufacturer to be pointing out that their brand is a difficult thing to pronounce for certain people and it kind of I don't know, it's kind of a weakness. I think the best brands have got names that you can repeat and you remember instantly, like Kodak, which doesn't mean anything in any language, but apparently can be remembered and pronounced very easily by those of, of any language. But anyway, yeah, Hyundai, there it is. And um, yeah, I'm going to spoil the, the result now because that, I think, wins. Um, 34 grand gets five stars and uh, yeah, nice a nice feature comparing cars that uh, you might want. Nice story now with great photography again by Aston Parrott on the uh, the 996 that belongs uh, to Jethro, Jethro Bovington. And he's had a 991 911 engine put in here, his 996 911. Excuse me for bombarding you with numbers. And it sprayed this bonkers metallic rhubarb colour. That's probably a fancy Porsche name for that. And it's a great story about putting the engine you want in the car you want and to help with the practicality of it all. So this is actually pretty good. This is, to me, this is the acceptable face of Porsche content and um, yeah I'd really like that car <laughs> that's uh, that's one I would love to do myself then back to the cover feature so this is a feature by Steve Sutcliffe and it says that Bugatti's next hypercar will be built under the ownership of EB experts Rimac EV experts Rimac we drive the current ultimates from both marks on the stunning road to southern Croatia and imagine what the future might hold and um, yeah I cannot get into 
any of this. Like photography's great, I'm sure there's a huge amount of work gone into getting it, but I cannot relate to these cars at all. And um, is this like an either or feature? Are you gonna buy one or the other? Or they're both now from the same company? Are they sharing stuff? I can't even be asked to read it, which is an awful thing to say really, because I'm sure there's a lot of work that got into it. One thing I will say is uh, at the Festival of Speed last year, so 2022, and Mr. Rimac spent quite a lot of time chatting to my girlfriend's lad about hypercars and he was so lovely, he was so charming and very friendly and really didn't mind spending a lot of time with a spotty oik telling him uh, interesting things about, uh, about the company and so on. So that was fantastic. That's nice to know that there's real people behind it. And uh, yeah, there we go. There's a lot of um, really super uh, photography here. Um, it says here, you know, it may uh, the Nevera may lay claim to being the world's fastest production EV, but it's not all about straight land speed. As a foray into the car's drift mode demonstrates, demonstrates. I, I just don't get it. Sorry, I'm an old man now. I don't get. Just why would you? What would you? What would you do with it? Where would you take it? Man, I'm so grumpy. So yeah, this on the left, the Bugatti Chiron Super Sport is 2.8 million of your pounds, gets five stars, and the Rimac Nevera gets also five stars, and that's 2.1 million uh, quid. Um, I really don't know what I would do with it, but I know a lot of people watching, <laughs> if there's anybody watching and listening, probably love these, but nope. Um, another advert for the magazine. And uh, yeah, then the guys, uh, Richard Ming goes up to Sweden to try to set a record for the world's largest uh, continuous vehicle drift on ice. The record was 3.87 miles, it says here. So they go up to Sweden and take a Skoda Enyaq 4, or is that IV? I don't know, VRS. That VRS name's kind of special, isn't it? Um, anyway, I'm gonna spoil the story because basically, yes, they can do that. But like, I don't know what this Enyaq is. I'm pretty sure it's very closely related to the Macan T earlier in it. And, um, well, yeah, anyway, they, uh, they won, which was great. They, uh, they beat the record, and there they are collecting their uh, Guinness World Records certificate in the snow. Do love that green, uh, green colour that Skoda favour for their press stuff. So, um, so there's the story. Now, this is more like it. This is one from Jethro. This is uh, a state of play, uh, if you excuse the, the playing words there. And this pits the uh, Audi RS6 Avant against BMW's M3 Touring. And I've always had a thing for, for hot estate cars. I think they're, uh, they're hopefully surviving the cull of interesting cars as everything goes SUV shaped or everything seems to be a variant of the Volkswagen Golf. Um, these are really interesting cars, but my God, these are pricey now as well. Um, my Volvo 850R I had, and I've had a couple of semi-hot, tepid, shall we say, BMW states over the years, and they're great things to drive. Check this photo out here where you can see there the tyre blocks are on the left and the tyres, rear tyres really working under compression. I don't know how the car they got that car so sideways on such narrow little roads, but they did. And um, yeah, lovely sunset. Um, yeah, I think the, the M3 pips it uh, by five stars to four and a half there. Then on to another feature by Steve Sutcliffe. This is called Desert Storm. Um, I'm quite hungry at the minute. I actually read that as Desert Storm. Um, and the, the, uh, the 911 that you see charging through the desert there has this rough roads uh, logo on the side, which is supposed to make you think of uh, Rothmans, I suppose. and. Uh, the uh, Paris-Dakar um, winning cars. And here it is doing huge skids in the desert. This is very silly and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, Porsche says the Dakar can pretty much go anywhere a Cayenne can. Thank you, okay. Do your own joke about school runs there. Um, wonderful thing, great pictures, great car. Skipping through, now this is fantastic. So this section, Fast Fleet, talks about different cars that are on long-term test by the guys and some are owned by their, their, the editorial staff. So there's some fairly Ordinary stuff, Skoda Superb, Volkswagen RT on, then there's a C63, which is a fancy thing, of course, and a 208 GTI. This one, this is a Merchilago, uh, um, I think it's owned by Simon George, and the story of this is it's up to 289,000 miles, and he bought it and rented it out to those track day experience guys. So it's had a lot of ham-footed idiots doing skids in this thing over the years, and it's had a couple of engines and a few clutches and a lot of work. But basically, in this story, he talks about running over a set of ladders on the M1, uh, which does colossal damage uh, to the car, and the repair costs came to £173,000. That's just crazy. But I love it. It's... um. On one hand, it's a vehicle that the majority of us will never own. On the other hand, it's great to see it actually being used and sadly, you know, suffering mishaps, but recovering from mishaps that, that happen to ordinary people too. So that's a really great story. 
Um, I'm not that interested in the Skoda Superb there. Um, pff, mileage, costs, yeah, numbers. I, I really don't get into that. Richard Porter here has just bought a Panda 100 horsepower. I've got a real soft spot for these because in my household there are three uh, Fiat's and two of those are Type 169 Pandas. Neither of them are 100 horsepower, but that's something that uh, I think the kids aspire to. Um, yeah, it points out two things that seem to happen to all of these. It's got a bouncy, bouncy ride and electrical sillies where in this instance the, uh, the heater doesn't seem to be working as it should. But you forgive it because it's small and it's cheap and it's Italian and yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, I will read this article and I will digest it and I hope to hear more about this little car in future issues. Maserati Ghibli Trofeo, BMW 240X, blah de blah uh, Cooper or whatever that is, um, F-Pace, electrical problems, Peugeot 208, that's more interesting than I thought it would be. Um, yeah, it's, it's a car that perhaps doesn't get the attention that it should. Um, yeah, I'll leave you to come back and read that if you're really into it. Audi TT, MX-5, another advert for Evo, and then into the classifieds. Um, this is an advert for birds who do uh, suspension uh, modifications to performance BMWs. And I love these guys and I'm going to give them a, a hello if you're listening, probably they're not. Um, because uh, like back in the last year, my 5 Series uh, ate its alternator on the M25 at the section near the uh, Heathrow Airport where it's f at least five lanes. And I think on the news I heard that they thought it was a just stop oil protest, but it wasn't. It was me broken down and the traffic ground to a halt and had it traded to birds nearby who replaced it and were the nicest people to deal with. It was really nice to get some old fashioned service out of them. So yeah, um, I ought to perhaps take my BMW there for some performance bits as well as just getting me out of the poop. A um, few more adverts, adverts for tyres. The knowledge in the back of course is, uh, yeah, Evo's rating for many classic, uh, classic cars. I do like to go through those and read and see if I would agree with it. Another bloody watch thing, tally ho for that, and uh, all the way to the back where Porter talks about something quite interesting. This is a Panther Solo, there's an oddity for you. So this is a 1980s, kind of a one-off uh, mid-engine thing that should have been a great sports car, revived an old name and really didn't come to anything once the owner drove an MR2 and realised that MR2s were way better than this and nobody's going to buy it. But um, as Porter says, it looked great and brimmed with promise and it's a, it's a nice story. I like reading about these uh, quirky oddities. And at the back, I don't know, you pick up Evo, I pick up Evo and think, you know, this is a magazine for me. But then you look at the adverts and think, this is a Cupra. And I just don't get Cupra as a brand. This is a sub-brand of Seat, which is a sub-brand of Volkswagen, which is the same as Audi and Skoda and all the others. And if I sound like I'm giving this a hard time, then I am. Because this here, the language is so bold. It says, it's so brave, it could only mean the start of a new era. It's not, it's a Volkswagen with bronze bits glued onto it. Get over yourself. Anyway, that, my friends, is Evo Magazine. I'm going to move on now to Practical Performance Car. This is kind of the other end of the publishing spectrum. So uh, where Evo uh, really is the thrill of driving and it's uh, Bugattis and Rimax and all that fancy stuff, uh, PPC Magazine uh, is Performance Tuning for Grown-Ups. Now, this magazine went out of print about a year or so ago, and I um, yeah, there should be a full disclosure here. I wrote for this magazine for many years and uh, I absolutely love it and it is rough and shonky and yeah people might say that print uh, you know print lives and print goes on but it does have to adapt and I think sadly with PPC their, their, their slap strap line really was stick a V8 in it that was it take a, an ordinary-ish kind of motor or something cheap or rear-wheel drive and stick a V8 in it and people don't seem to do that anymore or they will pay people to do it uh, take it to places like Retro Power do a fabulous job, but this is about doing it yourself. And I love this for a number of reasons, not just because I'm in it, this tiny little coffee stained <laughs> picture in the corner is, uh, was my story. But here they've put a, a 27 litre engine into a, into a, um, it was a V12 into a Ford Crown Vic. Now, those that know PPC will know that the, the two guys that, that ran it behind it, Will and Kev, um, they were friends with a chap called Charlie Broomfield who had a 27 litre engined Rover SD1. I think it was a Meteor engine um, out of a tank um, and just an absolutely bonkers thing. And I recall stories, uh, I met Charlie once and he says the F word like you or I would use punctuation. Um, really interesting sweary guy. 
and he wrote to the DVLA to notify them of the engine swap and they wrote back to him um, and listed his car as a 2.7 litre, not a 27 litre, presumably because some clerk in Swansea couldn't get their head around somebody putting such a monstrous engine in. Now I love this and some of the guys uh, in here I'm still in contact with and t friends with today, Mankey Cheng for example, uh, Mark Hammersley, um, uh, Dan Bevis writes for a few of the publications now too, but I love this. This was the first place to print my shonky words and therefore I love it, um, but it's so random. Like This is towards the end of its life PPC, this is an issue from uh, April 2020 and you see the first couple of pages are quite thick paper, quite glossy, that's great, and then very quickly you get into real like, tissue paper print quality. But I don't think that's the reason that it uh, that the magazine went under because the content is is great. I just think there's far fewer people into this kind of content anymore. Nice. This is a letter in here. I'd actually forgot I'd written this in. I'd written in with this letter until I picked this up to film this podcast. There's a picture of a Dutton Surf, which is a god awful kit car, which is uh, amphibious. And uh, yeah, I write in here, I enjoyed your kit car trip down memory lane recently. You may be amused, but not surprised to know that I broke down in this thing recently. The river arrogant high tide in winter has no hard shoulder and it was not pleasant. And I actually forgotten I'd done that and that was, uh, that was good fun. Bit of a shameless plug. So, on any Sunday feature where they uh, basically uh, bomb around different car shows and here they're at the Na uh, National Agricultural Centre, which is a bit of a scruffy cow pat strewn place to look at rally cars, which is pretty good. A look at some of the uh, original cars that inspired Tamaya. Lots of adverts, and this was my feature. So this is, yeah, the right car, the right roads at the right time. Do it all before Greta has us all wheel clamped. Bit of a gammony, uh, gammony headline there. But this was the ultimate Alps road trip. So the story is, I basically borrowed this XJ6 from a friend of mine and did every single Swiss pass over a certain height. And it was amazing. So uh, I can't really slag off photography in the rest of this magazine because this photography is pretty much all of it is mine. This is a stock photo, actually. So every one of the, the mountain passes we did, and it was absolutely huge fun. And as I write here, we drove all day and didn't see another car. This was my thing. Um, you may know I published a book called Nothing Handles Like a Rental Car, but I, I got into road tripping in a really big way and realised that the, the car was less interesting than the journey and the destination. And... Um, I would regularly do this, budget airline flight, beg, borrow, steal a car and go and have an adventure in it. So yeah, it was um, it was really, really good fun to, to do this and uh, I heartily recommend that everybody does it. And this of course was just before Covid kicked off, so in many respects it was kind of the end of the easy road trip era for a few years. Let's move on. Yeah, there's a slammed VW there, which is really cool. Seats made from an old beer barrel. I mean, whether that was out of necessity or because it just sounds cool, I don't know. But my God, this thing is absolutely awesome. Um, this is quite funny. So the caption here, the captions were written, I think, mostly by Will Holman. And Will is an exceptionally sweary bloke. And he says here, um, people moan about dog shit on the beaches. So apologies for the language there. And there he is, of course, driving his Beetle. I had a bit of a thing where I would see how many swear words I could get into a feature before they noticed or cared. And I think I used the F-bomb about four times in one feature once. I don't remember what I was writing about. And they printed it anyway. And then I gave up trying to be clever because what's the point? It's not very nice anyway. But yeah, they really did print all sorts. But, I mean, the photography of readers' cars here, it's so shonky. And it's... I don't know, I think that's what, what killed it. This is outside Will's house in Northamptonshire, and this is a 407 that he had that was riddled with electrical problems and stories of laptops and stuff. And in many respects, this is kind of a pointer to the demise of the magazine, because when they started, it was sticking Rover V8s into Ford Capris and stuff like that. And now it's dicking around with laptops and cables and remaps and stuff. And there's definitely a market for that. But I don't think those kind of people that are into that buy magazines. And that probably was uh, one of the things that saw this magazine off. Bit of a clumsy edit there. It's almost like I've ne never done this before, isn't it? Um, anyway, <laughs> excuse me for that. Um, some fantastic little anecdotes from my time at PPC, Practical Performance Car. I was never a staff writer there. I just contributed various bits and bobs over the years and they generally printed it, swear words and all. Um, and it was a great deal of fun. The storage unit they had in Corby, the, the staff writers there, Will and James and Kev would, and the others would store their own cars. So it's a lovely beat up old factory building in quite a rough part of town. 
And inside, uh, they had things like uh, Will's. Per um, Will had a Mercedes uh, 560 SEC, lovely great barge of a thing. They had a uh, chop top Rolls Royce that was in and out of there for a while. Uh, James Wynn Stanley had a Series One Elise that had a clam that never quite fitted, and Kev Leeper had, amongst other things, uh, a Renault Five. Gordini replica I think it was, a beautiful little car in silver and they all seemed to spend forever trying to fix it and never quite finishing them but that was kind of part of the fun. The place was a bit of a dump mind you and a couple of funny things just as a postscript really. Uh, there's one instance where somebody opened the drawer of the photocopier machine to replace the toner in the photocopier and just found a rat in there staring back at them. The place was full of rats. And just before they moved out, they changed the, the steel roller shutter doors on it for additional security because it was a yeah, fairly rough part of town. And then once they'd done that, they found that they'd basically entombed their own cars because a couple of the bigger motors wouldn't fit out through the new roller shutter doors. So who knows, if you've bought a, uh, a factory unit in Corby and found a couple of abandoned old cars in there, that's probably the reason why. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Just before I sign off, next issue, we're going to look at the March 2023 issue of Car Magazine, and slightly less conventionally, this, which is an absolute classic. This is jalopy. This is long out of print and didn't last for very long. Basically, it celebrates probably some of the uh, quirkier stuff, shall we say, on the roads, but the buyer's guide in it is fantastic. Just to give you a little taste, for example here, in the buyer's guide, they've got Porsche, Volkswagen, Alfa Romeo, for example. Here, Contadini, little known manufacturer, little known manufacturer originally based in Venice. Apparently there was a car called a Contadini Lambrusco that had spaghetti harvesting equipment fitted. But a casual xenophobia there, most amusing. And anyway, I hope you subscribe and leave me some comments. I'll do my best to reply. And thank you very much for listening.